It's Adam here for PC Monitors, and in this video I'm going to be taking a look at the OSD on-screen display menu system of the Acer XB273K. The OSD is controlled by pressable buttons at the rear of the monitor, along the right side. You can see them there. There's also a little joystick, which is what you mainly use for controlling the monitor. Before I delve into the OSD itself, or even what the buttons themselves do, I'm going to talk about the ambient lighting feature. And the reason I like to do this early on is because that's really the only feature some users will be watching this video to see. To access the ambient light feature, you go into the main menu system, so you click the joystick in once, and then it brings up this quick menu, press it again, and then you go down to System, Ambient Light, and that's where you can control it. You can have it set to all, which means that the light at the bottom, so there's an LED strip at the bottom there, so you can see that there are several lights there. And the flickering you see on the camera, I am sorry about that, it's just the camera picking that up, because this particular lighting does use pulse width modulation, that's very standard for ambient lighting solutions on monitors. Um, the backlight itself doesn't flicker as you can see, but but you don't really see that to the eye. Um, I mean, if you're particularly sensitive to flickering, you might do, but it's really very obnoxious on the camera, but in real life, not so much. So if you have that set to all, it has that one at the bottom there. It also has this at the rear, again, sorry about the flickering. And it's mainly at the top of the ventilation slats there, where you'll see that. And you can see it sort of illuminates behind the monitor just slightly, or you can have it just set to have the rear lights active or just the bottom lights active, depending on your preferences. The LED colour, I've got it set to screen colour now, so that will mimic the colours on the screen. It doesn't really ever show particularly saturated colours, so even if I've got quite a vibrant desktop background, it's always a mixture of the colours, but it kind of does bias it towards sort of a more red hue because I've got quite a lot of red showing on the screen now and it kind of works nicely if you like that kind of thing. It's not as saturated as say uh, Philips Ambilight, the solution they have on some of their TVs more more than monitors and, and it's also some monitors so it, it's not quite as sort of lively and saturated as that but it kind of does the trick. Alternatively you can just have that set to red or green, or blue, or white. And white's kind of a cool white. It's actually not quite as blue as it appears on the video. It's just a sort of high color temperature white. And you can see that there's a little bit of a glow behind the monitor, but the backlight back there, um, the LED light lighting strip that illuminates the rear of the monitor, isn't actually particularly powerful. So it doesn't really, give it enough of effect to be considered a bias light or anything like that. But it does sort of give a little bit of illumination around the monitor. You can also have it set to orange. So that's a more kind of warm colour. I actually quite like to use this myself in the evening because I don't like to expose myself to too much blue light and, and the, the cool white is too blue for my taste. So again, it um, gives a little bit of a halo at the top and behind the monitor, but nothing substantial. MNT status. And this means if you've got G-Sync active, it will glow red, whereas if G-Sync is not active, it'll glow white. But this doesn't mean that the technology is actively being used. It just means it's actually enabled in the graphics driver. You can also set the screen brightness. So I've got the, at the maximum brightness at the moment, which is 32. You can decrease that in, in single unit increments all the way down to one, which is very dim indeed, practically off. There's LED on in sleep, which really does what it says there. It means that if the monitor goes into standby or you've cut the signal to the computer, so you've turned your PC off, it'll still have the LED on until you switch the monitor off using the little power button. And technically it's still on standby when you turn it off with the power button, but it's uh, sort of the lowest power state you can achieve without unplugging the whole thing. If you have this set to not um, the screen color, but one of the sort of fixed colors, white, for example, you can change the lighting style. There are various different sort of animation patterns it'll do. 
So this one's called Breathing. Unfortunately, these are going to be a bit difficult to show you on the video because of the flickering, but this just sort of pulses every now and then. So you can see it just then. Flashing, which pulses more rapidly. It's a bit distracting, to be honest. In fact, very distracting, so I wouldn't really recommend that one. A simple shift, which is just another animation pattern. Gradient shift. Simple filling. And at this stage, I'm hoping there aren't too many of these because I don't really want to spend all day showing you these, but you kind of get the idea. Various different lighting styles. One way filling, sort of a almost stroboscopic effect, that one could certainly be rather distracting. Two way filling, which will do it left and right. Disco monitor. Motion point, which is just another animation style. Zoom. Discolor, so that cycles various different colors and you can have that set to discolor with one color or two colors or more colors. So this will sort of do a weird rainbow effect, I should imagine. Water wave. I think I'm near the end, so I might as well just show you all of them, I've decided. Yeah, so there we are, back to fixed. So that's just a static one. This is my preferred type of lighting to use, non-distracting to me. The top button is the power button. Below that, you can press any of the buttons or indeed press the joystick in, and it brings up this quick menu, which I showed you briefly just before. So the first function there changes the mode. So that's the preset mode of the monitor. There's G1, G2 and G3. They're called Action, Racing and Sports. And these offer good amounts of flexibility. I talk a bit more about these in the written review, but you can essentially have three different presets. You can't change everything because some adjustments you make, like the colour channels, are applied universally. So they will not apply just to one of these, but not the other, if that makes sense. There's User Mode, and if you change anything, for example, in the standard preset, which is the factory default, it'll then just switch to user mode. Perhaps not if you change anything, but most of the settings you change um, in any of your other presets will then switch to user mode. And all the presets really do is just change various things you could ad adjust manually yourself anyway in the OSD. I find the standard setting just fine if I had to pick one of the presets. But I prefer to make manual adjustments, so I'd then switch to the user mode after I've made my little adjustments. So the G1, G2 and G3, they're useful. Action I use as my test settings, and racing I have set up as a low blue light version of my test settings. So I use that for my own relaxing evening viewing, if you like. Next is peak white nits. That's just the brightness slider. So instead of giving you a percentage of brightness, it shows you a value in candelars per metre squared, or nits as they call them here. I don't like to use the term nits, it's not as scientific, and it applies to head lice as well as monitor brightness, so it's not a very nice term to use. You can have that set to 50, which is the lowest it'll go. And I have also should mention that if you measure the luminance, it's actually rather close, or at least on my sample, it was rather close to the stated value here. So it goes from 50, all the way up to 450, I believe. 450. So this can give you a sort of better representation of the brightness. If you're trying to target, say, 160 candelars per meter squared or 120, whatever your preferences might be, or depending on your room lighting, just makes it a little bit easier. Next up, there's input, which allows you to select the input used by the monitor, display port or HDMI. And then there's the main menu itself. So if you press the joystick in, again, you'll access the main menu. That's set into various different sections. Picture, colour, audio, gaming, OSD and system. There's also save settings too. So once you've modified them according to your taste, you can then save them as one of the G1, G2 or G3 presets. Picture first allows you to change the brightness, the contrast, 
There's blue light, that's the low blue light mode. 50% is the most effective. 60% has a slightly weaker effect, 70% weaker again, 80 weaker again, and off. So 50% that would suggest it cuts your blue light emission in half. It also adjusts the brightness. So you can see it's at 270 candelas per meter squared. If I recall correctly, that is actually dimmer than the factory defaults, but most users would want to dim that further. And you can, of course, do that. So you can have low blue light, 50%, dimmer again. You notice I mentioned I used racing as my preferred sort of evening viewing settings, not for specifically testing of the monitor, but just for my own viewing comfort. And I have the peak white knit set to 170 candelas per meter squared. And I've got the blue light setting on. It says off there, but that's because if you go into colour, it has the blue light setting memorised there for colour temp. And I'll go on to this shortly. Don't get too uh, bogged down by all of that. I'll just set it back to my action preset, which is my test settings. Next, there's Dark Boost, much like BenQ's Black Equalizer. Other manufacturers have their own variant of this as well. So this enhances the gamma, it enhances the visibility of dark shades, makes them lighter than they should be. Designed to give you a competitive edge in games by making enemies stand out more in dark areas, that kind of thing. So you can set that to level one, which gives you a slight bump up. You can see that with the test squares there. Just be aware that what you see on the video does not represent exactly how things look in reality. But you can still see the relative effect there. Bumps up the brightness, lightens up those shades. Level two, another bump up. Level three, the strongest bump up. And this is actually quite good compared to some manufacturers' implementations of this because it's quite gentle. Level one is actually just a gentle boost and it specifically targets the sort of darker shades and the medium to darker shades. It doesn't sort of wash the image out. It doesn't affect your black point, that kind of thing. So you don't lose contrast as you'd get with some implementations of this kind of feature. Next there's backlight response and that's tied to the SDR variable backlight setting. So SDR variable backlight enables some local dimming capability on the monitor and that's all explored in the review. And the backlight response setting is also explored in the review. But essentially, you'll want to keep that on gaming, which will give you the fastest response for the variable backlight, the local dimming capability. Hybrid is sort of somewhere between the fastest and slowest, and desktop is the slowest. I didn't see any problems keeping this on with the gaming setting, so I would just recommend using that. Auto brightness. There's a light sensor at the top of the monitor, and... This will allow the monitor to adjust its brightness based on the ambient brightness of the room. And you can also change the peak white knit setting yourself based on your preferences. So it gives you a bit of adjustability. I personally find even if you set the peak white knits as high as it'll go and you set the auto brightness on, it's actually dimmer than I'd like in general. So I don't actually much like this feature. I don't think it gives you enough flexibility, but some users might like it, especially if you prefer generally a dimmer image and particularly dimmer if your room lighting itself dims. So it does have some utility for some users. Auto black level. This is a bit of a weird setting, to be honest. It's kind of like um, a sort of dynamic contrast setting. It adjusts the gamma and the brightness a bit based on very dark shades if you've got lots of dark shades on the screen at the same time. But I've tested this a bit and I honestly don't think it makes much of a difference. It's quite a subtle difference it seems to make. Um, so I would just generally leave that off because you might notice some sort of fluctuations in brightness which you weren't expecting. By all means experiment with it yourself, but I think it's a very subtle effect and doesn't really seem to bring any clear benefit um, and could potentially give some drawbacks. Next is colour. That allows you to change things like the relative gamma. So if you set that to default, it will give you 2.2 if your unit is calibrated correctly, as mine was, or plus 0.3, plus 0.6. So plus 0.6 gives you a significantly higher gamma. And I measured these with my colorimeter, and they were indeed what they said. So plus 0.3 would give you 2.5 gamma if you measured it and plus 0.6 would give you 2.8, so that's extremely high gamma. And then there's minus 0.3 if you want reduced gamma, 
and minus 0.6. I mean, you can see how ridiculously flooded uh, that makes things and all of those grey squares look practically the same, not attractive. SDR colours, sRGB, that's an sRGB emulation setting and that cuts down the colour gamut so that it corresponds closely to sRGB rather than extending far beyond it. So that cuts down your saturation levels and it is an effective sRGB emulation setting. It doesn't have an impact on contrast, it really just focuses on the colour gamut. You can see it quite clearly with this background here. Now be aware that what you see on the video is exaggerated and you won't see exactly how things look to the eye, but you can certainly see the relative effect again. Colours are more saturated using the native gamut, less saturated using the sRGB emulation setting there. There are two little settings here, DP and HDMI, YCBCR, sRGB. Um, basically these are the slight gamma corrections which will apply if you're running the monitor and you're using chroma subsampling, so you're running it at 144 hertz at the native resolution using the display port, for example. And this will just apply a gamma correction and leave this on. There's no reason to disable it. It'll just mean that if you've got the monitor running at 144 hertz, the colors will look much as they did when you were running at 120 hertz. That's what it'll mean to most users. Color temp user allows you to manually adjust the red, green, and blue color channels. Or well, there are various different presets you can set that to. So there's warm, normal, cool, blue light, which is when you're using one of the low blue light settings. So you can see the sort of relative effect these do. Warm is the factory defaults, everything in their neutral position. Normal has some slight adjustments. Or maybe that was a factory default. I can't really remember. It's a while since I really looked at the factory defaults, but um, it'll be mentioned in the written review. Cool. Reduces your red channel, makes things look cooler, raises the white point. And blue light, of course, massively reduces the blue colour channel. And that's indeed what low blue light settings should do. Audio allows you to adjust the volume of the integrated speakers or anything connected to the 3.5mm jack. Gaming. This has the exciting settings of the monitor, so there's overdrive. You can set that to off, normal or extreme. Mentioned in the written review, normal is clearly the best setting, very well optimised, no reason to use any of the other settings, in my opinion. Overclock, and if you set this to on, you'll unlock the 144Hz refresh rate at the native resolution. If you, for whatever reason, don't want to use 144Hz and you don't want it to be a listed refresh rate for you, then just set that to off. And it says there max refresh, but on some monitors you can select various different values, uh, on this it's just 144 Hz or nothing for the overclock. Then you press apply and reboot and it'll cycle through its power cycle again and hopefully 144 Hz will be a listed resolution. If not, try the whole process again, perhaps reinstall your graphics driver, whatever you need to do. Aim point, this will put a crosshair in the centre of the screen. There are various different styles, icon 1, Icon 2 and Icon 3, you can see the designs there. And if I exit the OSD, you can see the little crosshair in the middle there. OSD allows you to change the language that the OSD is displayed in. The idle timeout period or OSD timeout. So that's how long after the last button press in seconds before the OSD automatically disappears for you. Or you can exit at any time using the little X or exit button there. Refresh rate number. That will display the refresh rate towards the top right of the screen. See that just at the uh, top right there. So that acts as a frame rate counter if you've got G-Sync active. OSD lock, which will mean that you can't access the OSD without unlocking it first to stop younger family members in particular messing around with your settings and that kind of thing. System allows you to change the input used by the monitor, ambient light, which I've already gone through, hotkey assignment, modes and brightness. So this will allow you to change the hotkey, so the first key there and the second key there to various different features if you prefer to use other features. So you can have it set to modes, contrast, blue light, volume, overdrive, relative gamma, so there you are, that's what you can set it to. 
same with hotkey too. Next there's wide mode and you can set that to aspect or one to one. Be aware that this is a G-Sync monitor and as such you don't have any scaling capability when you're connected using DisplayPort. You have to use GPU scaling, it's the same with all G-Sync monitors. But if you're connected using HDMI, you can set this to aspect, which will give you a screen fill um, in most cases. So say you're running the full HD resolution, you'll have all the pixels active. If you have it set to one-to-one, -to -one, you won't get any distortion on the image, but you'll get a big black border around it instead. So that's what that setting does. Deep sleep. That is a, an energy saving feature, basically. If you have this on, the monitor will be allowed to go into a deeper state of standby, saving you sort of a fraction of a watt of uh, power consumption. However, some people will find that if you've got this set to on, you can notice that sometimes the monitor won't wake from the sleep properly, especially if you send your computer to sleep, you'll find that the monitor won't wake up properly. And if you're having problems with that, try and disable this. So have deep sleep set to off and see if you notice an improvement there. And finally, there's quick start mode, um, or finally on this menu, I should say. And that just will give you a, if you've got that set to off, which is the default, it'll give you a little splash screen when you start the monitor up and it'll take a little bit longer to actually turn on. If you've got that set to on, it won't give you the splash screen and it'll turn on more quickly. Save settings too, which I've already mentioned before. So you can save it to game mode, action, racing or sports, if you want to use that as one of your presets. A few final things to go through. There's a little eye, which is an information section there, and that will show you the resolution, the refresh rate that's currently being used, or more specifically the maximum refresh rate, so the static refresh rate you've selected. If you've got NVIDIA G-Sync active, it'll tell you, and be aware that the refresh rate there will not change according to the frame rate, but you can use the counter um, that I showed you before if you want to display the current frame rate when you've got G-Sync active. There's format, so that displays the pixel format being used. Um, and I go through that a bit in the review and show you some sort of different examples of what that might be. There's the range, EOTF. So these settings, they're just for your information, really. They will change depending on the resolution you're using, the refresh rate or the combination of those things, um, and whether you've got HDR active or not. So you see, for example, SDR, sRGB means you've got SDR active. If I enable HDR, which I'll just do quickly, so I've got HDR active now, I'm on the information section, you can see this is all completely different to the format um, and the EOTF setting different um, to what they were before. The other thing to note when you've got HDR active, the settings change, so various things are greyed out, you can't change the brightness manually, or the contrast, dark boost, various different settings greyed out. You can adjust the red, green and blue colour channels um, and just sort of fine tune things according to that when you've got HDR active as well. The little sort of four squares there, by the way, I didn't show you that before, but all that does is just go back to the sort of modes menu so you can change to one of the presets. And the final thing to note, blue power LED. I've shown you the full OSD now. There is no setting to disable that. Um, when the monitor's on and it is forward facing. It, I know that can annoy some users. Some users prefer to have a power LED off. All I can recommend is just cover it with a little bit of black tape if it annoys you uh, that much. It glows amber when the monitor's in standby or in a low power state. But that's really all there is to the OSD on screen display menu system of the Acer XB273K. Be sure to check out the full review on PCMonitors.info. There's a link to that in the description of the video alongside information about how you can support the work that we do.